This is 21st Century Reformation at 21stcr.org. Writing about the monumental problem produced by Trinitarianism and the Church Council, Martin Werner of Bern, a Swiss guy, Alex, a Swiss friend of yours, not living now, wrote this. The Catholic theologians, that's to say the Orthodox theologians, could certainly prove by means of Scripture the distinction of the Son's personality from that of God the Father. You, you understand that? Oneness would not have been an option for them, right? They could see the Son wasn't the Father. It's not rocket science, but they saw that clearly. But the Catholic theologians landed themselves in a dilemma. As soon as they sought to prove against the oneness people, against the modalists, a correspondingly clear-cut biblical doctrine concerning the agreement of the dogma of the deity, note the spelling E-I-T-Y, deity of the Father and the Son with monotheism. Very clear, right? It's very difficult to make two into one. That's the point there. Now, I love this statement. I get excited about this one. For according to the New Testament witnesses, in the teaching of Jesus, Jesus and the apostles relative to monotheism, the monotheism that is of the Old Testament, and Judaism, there had been no element of change whatsoever. I love that. When I read that, it's, you know, I'm doing aha moments and careening around the room. No change whatsoever. Mark 12, 29, a refrigerator time verse, recorded the confirmation of Jesus himself without any reservation of the supreme monotheistic confession of faith of Israelite religion in its complete form. That should have changed the world, that sentence. So what then are these Trinitarians doing, reciting a creed that Jesus would not have recognized, perhaps? That's amazing. So then, the attempts of the Orthodox to demonstrate the agreement of their dogma of two divine persons with monotheism remained seriously uncertain and contradictory. Do we need that in our lives? Uncertainty? And contradiction. I don't think so. You're frying your brain. You're, you're, you're muddling your thinking with all of that stuff. Don't do it. You might be poisoning yourself if you happen to believe in two gods as we used to. That's to say, if the son's own personality was at the same time emphasized over against the father, if you separate them, that's difficult. The most potent cause of all the difficulties, dilemma and sophistry, awful thing, you need to avoid that, of this situation was the deficiency of the scriptural evidence. In other words, the Bible didn't say it. No, my Georgia, the Bible just didn't say that. None of the contending parties could obtain from scripture, from the Bible, uh, a clear, now on to nice words, and decisive argument for the solution of the problem. Problem. Why is theology always a problem? of the reconciliation between an unlimited monotheism of Jesus and the distinction of the Son from the Father, right? It was a hopeless problem. I think it's still disturbing the thinking of millions, billions of people. Your job is to unscramble that mess somehow. I think that Jesus will eventually do it, but we better make a start now. I maintain, therefore, that Christianity is the only world religion which begins by discarding its own founder's creeds. Okay, write to the newspapers. Yes, do. Write to the local paper. They probably won't publish you because the question is one that will not get a clear answer. If you say, what's the creed of Jesus? It's what you don't say that makes you a liar. And a half-truth is a whole lie very often. Okay, so write to the newspapers or blog about this. Get on the radio. Do what you can. Talk to your neighbors to get that question raised. Now, the International Critical Commentary, this is give you support. The ICC, you know, top of the line, the most expert thing there is in commentary on First Peter, says, confesses, it would be rash to conclude that Peter identified Yahweh with Christ. I think very rash. There are certain verses which prevented that. Notice that, Psalm 110.1. The Lord said to my Lord, Yahweh says to Adoni, Adoni, Adoni. We haven't begun with that yet. You could have a ministry just for the rest of your lives talking about that second Lord which isn't God. It's Yahweh speaking to non-deity 195 times. Adoni does not mean God. It's sitting there. That's the most often quoted verse from the Old Testament and the New. Any of you could have a ministry just doing that one thing. 
Now, the late Eric Chang, bring him in here, after he had, as a professional, vigorously taught the Trinity for decades, was one who was transparently honest, I think, in his frank admission that Trinitarianism is polytheism. Wow, what an awful possibility. And that the church had altered the meaning of the word God. Dangerous business, right? We remember how words like marriage have undergone a complete change of meaning. You start saying that uh, five cents is no longer, or you say it's a dime rather than five cents. You're in a huge mess with words. Now we gain help, here's your encouragement, from some leading Trinitarian scholars. For example, this admission from a Trinitarian, Dr. Brown. That's not Michael Brown, another Brown. He says this, and the point was made by somebody earlier this week, this uh, session. It is a simple fact and an undeniable historical fact that several major doctrines that now seem central to the Christian faith, such as the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the nature of Christ, were not present in a full and self-defined, generally accepted uh, confessional form until the 4th and 5th centuries. If they are essential today, as all, and this man's writing as a Trinitarian, as all of the Orthodox creeds say they are, it must be because they're true. <laughs> yeah, I get it. But if they are true, then they must always have been true. Yeah, I suppose. But they cannot have become true only in the 4th and 5th century. You'd think not. But if they're both true and essential, how can it be that the early church took centuries to formulate them? That's a very great question that most of your friends, sleeping as they are in church, haven't faced. They need to begin to think, as Joel Hemper was saying. How about thinking? I gave you Isaiah 53, 11. By his knowledge, my servant, the Lord Messiah, will make many right when they're wrong. By his knowledge? Heaven forbid. Oh, that awful thing. Head knowledge. What's head knowledge? Where else do you have knowledge in your big toe? I don't think so. Head knowledge? What's that? Head knowledge. This is simple thinking, reason, intellect. Jesus loved that. Rabbis loved it. Okay. So then, I think that quote is quite interesting. Now, Eric Chang, I want to celebrate him for a moment or two, from his excellent introduction to The Only True God, free online. A must-read, you must read at least the first and second chapters. It's a long book, but at least read the beginning part of it. For all who espouse the one God of Jesus. He says this, Trinitarianism speaks of three persons who are all equally God. And then goes on to claim a place in monotheism by changing the definition of God into a divine nature or a substance or a Godhead in which the three persons all share and which means, of course, that this Godhead is not at all identical to the one and only personal God of the Bible. What? Could it be that you who go to Trinitarian churches, whoever does, actually that's not the same? Oh my goodness, this is an awful possibility. Rather scary, actually. That's what Chang is suggesting there. So then, uh, it's not identical, he says, to the only personal God of the Bible. So I ask this with great respect. Is it then sheep-stealing to invite a Baptist to a Unitarian congregation? Is it sheep-stealing, or are you rescuing them from a false God? I mean, this isn't a fair question. I'll leave you to answer it. Sheep-stealing? Not sure. Maybe you have to go and help them out. I don't know. That's an interesting question. Okay, where there is belief in more than one person who is God, that seems to be polytheism by definition. What we need to realize is that Trinitarianism is in essence, therefore, this is Chang speaking, a different faith, what? A different faith from biblical monotheism. In my introduction, if you get to read the translation, the quotes in the introduction are the best thing, thing. The quotes, not me, the quotes are wonderfully elucidating and clear on this point. They say that Christianity turned into a different religion from the second century. A different religion. Watch out. Dangerous. Then you need to be in the right religion. Okay. So we need, we, are we not dealing then, I said here, with a relatively simple matter, or Chang said rather, a simple matter of biblical interpretation, but with a far more profound matter of biblical faith. It's not just interpretation, that awful word, you know, well, I interpret this way and you interpret that way, but is it, in fact, not a a different faith? That's what he's asking here. True or false faith, he says, according to the scripture, is a matter of life or death. Wow. 
You better get it right. Isn't that reminiscent of what Dan was saying? What was that wonderful thing? Don't mess with this one. Don't mess with it. Don't, that's wonderful. Isn't that a wonderful acronym? Don't mess with this one. Grr. Get it right. And we did with baptism. I say this all the power I can. Don't mess with baptism. Don't even imagine not being baptized in water. That's to shake your fist at Jesus. Don't say, well, baptism doesn't matter if you want to get water. No, no, don't do it. Jesus said, repent and get baptized. That's it. Sit down, don't argue, and obey. That's what I feel. I'm getting very senile and old, but black and white. My dad used to say to me, Anthony, when you're 50 years older, you'll see everything in greys. <laughs> now you're 25 or 30, everything seems black and white. Wait till you're nearly 80, and everything will be grey. That's actually the opposite. I see this clearer. I may be wrong. I may be entirely wrong, but I put it to you that Jesus doesn't mess with obedience. He doesn't mess with that. You're in grand trouble if you don't get water baptized upon repentance. That seems to me clear. Okay. Then... He says, the situation is that it's not the scripture which governs the belief or dogma, but the dogma in these Trinitarian circles which governs the interpretation. This is usually done quite unconsciously. And Chang then very says this, as I know from experience, because of the belief that scripture has to be understood in this way. That is, we believed that this was the only right way to understand, and he did. It was, of course, never anyone's intention, of course not, how many people get up in the morning and say, I'm going to deceive these people? Oh, no, it's simply carelessness. They haven't examined these issues properly, and they wind up unconsciously deceiving. Okay. It was our faith which determined the way we understood things. Hence, as we've seen, it is at root a matter of faith. Right, important matter. Paul wrote, and this is me now, evil men, as he looked into the future, evil men will wax worse and worse, deceiving and what? Oh, it's, to, it's evil to be deceived. My goodness. Uh, Jesus puts the bar very high. Not impossibly high, but rather high. God will give them over, Paul said, to a spirit of deception because they did not receive a passion for truth in order to be saved. Anton, tin rapin tis alithias uke dexanto isto sothine aptus. I've been a Greek teacher for a while. And those words are imprinted in my mind. It's like Abba. You remember the word Abba? They remembered Maranatha and so on. That is powerful stuff. So refrigerator verse big time, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. Because a passion, not just a vague acceptance of truth, but a passion for truth they would not receive, just so they could be a little bit better. No, in order to be, wow, saved? So if you haven't got a passion for truth, you're in bad trouble on that text. So that's 2 Thessalonians 2.10. Then, failure to believe the truth, note, is equivalent to taking pleasure in wickedness. That's what Paul says. The opposite of loving the truth is to be wicked. Oh, my goodness. That's tough stuff. Their eyes, they have closed. This isn't Calvinism. God didn't preordain all this. Their eyes, Jesus said, quoting Isaiah 6, they closed them. Okay, their eyes they have closed. Otherwise, look at this. Otherwise, Jesus said, they could repent and be saved. My goodness. If they don't believe... They can't repent. And that's about believing the gospel of the kingdom, by the way. It's, it's ri riveting stuff. I think very interesting. Okay, so that's the parable of the sower. Now, Eric Chang again, uh, page two at the bottom. During the early four decades, the nearly, sorry, nearly four decades of serving as pastor, church leader, and teacher of many who were going to enter full-time ministry, I taught Trinitarianism, Trinitarian doctrine, with great zeal. As many who know me can testify. I note there in Romans 10 to zeal without what? Knowledge. Is not going to do you any good. Whoa! Paul said that. I admire those Jews. He said they're full of zeal. Well, that knowledge thing is creeping in again. That's Isaiah 53, 11. By his knowledge my wise servant will make many right. Knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. So you better get knowledge. Zeal isn't enough, apparently. Trinitarianism was what I drank in with my spiritual milk when I was a spiritual infant. Later in my biblical theological studies, my interest focused on Christology, wow, which I pursued with considerable intensity. My life centered on Jesus Messiah, this is Chang speaking. I studied and sought to practice his teaching with the utmost devotion. I did indeed worship one God, and that one God was Jesus. That's extraordinarily frank, isn't it? 
That's amazing. But that was the Jesus only thing. <laughs> amazing statement there. I worship that one God, Jesus. The one God revealed in the Old Testament, namely Yahweh. So Yahweh was Jesus. Wow. Yahweh was in practice replaced. You can't go around replacing God. Come on. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that, does it? How much worse can it get than replacing God? I was then, uh, this is about three years ago, and, and he wrote this in 2009. So about 2006, I think is right. I was pondering, this is Chang, this question. This is an, a new point to me. I hadn't thought of this one. How can the gospel be made known by us? I discovered that my Christianity was accompanied by some kind of prejudice against the Muslims, which had to be overcome. If I was to understand them and reach out to them. Also, I realized that the moment I said anything about the Trinity or said that Jesus is God, all communication with them would cease abruptly. How many, how many Muslims do we have in the world? A billion, is it? All right, so those billion people are not going to listen to a word you say if you say Jesus is God. So how then can the gospel be preached in the whole world? That's an interesting question. The same, of course, is true of Jews. Millions of Jews, as you know. So how can they be reached? Good question. Jesus cannot return because the gospel cannot be preached in the whole world. That's Matthew 24, 14. As long as it's Trinitarian. That's a very significant statement, isn't it? Who, on whose shoulders then does the job fall? Ah, those Unitarians who've understood that God is one, apparently. Wow. So then, uh, when I examined my own thoughts, I too realized my, that my Trinitarianism was at root incompatible with biblical monotheism. When I first faced the challenge of reevaluating my Trinitarianism in the light of the Bible, and then sharing that light with all who wish to see it, I thought I was alone in taking this stand. But when preparing this manuscript, I found Hans Kung, who also agreed with him that the Trinity is not biblical. And there are many others. That's my major point here. You've got lots of scholars. Don't let anybody tell you, well, you're the only guys who ever imagined that God was one. No, there are lots of scholars, more or less shyly, and more or less obscurely, are saying exactly what we're saying about the one God. Going on with Chang, Trinitarianism also insists on making the spirit of the Lord a distinct, i.e. third. Best, by the way, to say, I don't believe in a third person. If you just say, well, I, I think the spirit is impersonal, you may be misunderstood. The spirit is surely very personal. My spirit is coming to you now. Very personal, but not a second person for me, not a third person. So it's good to put in that word third, a distinct third person from Yahweh. For anyone some, is somewhat familiar with the Old Testament, this is something strange. Jews must wonder, indeed, whether Christians really have any understanding of the Bible at all. To argue that the spirit of Yahweh, God's spirit, is a person distinct from him, is like saying that the spirit of man, man's spirit, is a distinct individual who lives in you or with you as the first. This might be perceived by someone, this is Chang, someone who suffers from schizophrenia, <laughs> But to suggest that this is the case with God is lunacy, if not blasphemy. Now, you may judge of all this too strong language. I think he's making a point that should be carefully thought about. Chang was becoming part of a noble history. This is me now. To Michael Servetus and the Dutch Anabaptists, led by Adam Pastor, hero of ours, as well as to the whole community of Polish Anabaptists, the Trinity was a deviation from biblical monotheism, a mistaken attempt to translate apostolic belief in one God, the Father, into the language of Greek philosophy. Very, I thought Paul warned against that, didn't he? Watch out for philosophy. Worse still, the creeds and the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon were used in coercive, this is the worst part, coercive and destructive uh, ways to force, that's where it gets nasty, to force people to believe in these dogmas. This was all the more regrettable since the terminology of the discussion on Christology was itself, I love this, a jumble of ambiguous terms. Things that we reject and resent in any other field except sometimes theology. In sharp contrast, the Bible's plainly Unitarian creed. Okay, the freedom to explore apart from the tyranny of dogma, represented, for example, by the Athanasian Creed, which threatens death to deviants from Orthodox Trinitarianism, led to the rediscovery of a frequently forgotten element in the Church's presentation of Jesus. That's to say, his being 
a human being. And I avoid the word humanity. I don't even talk about it. What in the world is the humanity of Jesus? Let's talk about it being a human being. Why not? Humanity is this very vague, you know, sort of Greek philosophical idea. So they haven't talked about him being a man. It was widely admitted that traditional understandings of Jesus had often suffered from a latent docetism, horrible word, means he only seems to be a man. It only appears to be, he really isn't a man, but he appears only to be. That was an error. Belief that Jesus only seemed to be human, which for John, the apostle, signaled very antichrist. So anything that undermines the human Jesus, watch out. It's antichrist. The spirit we don't want. I see. Moreover, traditional formulations about Christ seem to demonstrate a fondness for a particular interpretation of John 1.1. 1, 1. Yes, of course. To the exclusion of the very human portraits presented by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. In fact, the Gospel of John had been allowed a more than proportionate influence in the formation of Christology. Could this have been because the style of John's writing, while actually very Hebraic, appealed to the speculative Greek mind and could be easily misunderstood or distorted by Gentiles. It seems that's what happened. A local Bible collector, this is me now, who is fascinated by the translation of John 1.1, 1, 1. compare the frequent emails one gets, yes, Anthony, but have you ever read John 1.1? 1, 1? Well, I have tried to look at it <laughs> occasionally. It's provided me now with 300 translations from the early times, that's in English, translations in English, spanning centuries of John 1.1. 1, 1. He's collected them all. He's got all the translations available. And he's, I've got them, uh, 1,300 of them, 300 of them. You wouldn't get much help for the Trinity from John 1.1. 1, 1. So they correct it to say something like, uh, they, they correct a mistaken impression that John intended two persons in John 1. Now this honest, now I'm turning now to another fellow I'm going to quote. This honest dissenter from the Church of England, David Watson, this clergyman, resigned his orders in the Church of England. Quote, A sympathetic study of traditional Jewish religion can reveal the extent to which the modern English Christian gives a meaning to the words of the New Testament different from that which was in the mind of the Jewish writers. Oh, my goodness. Just like when I get up and say, I'm mad about my flat, and you all think, I'm angry about my flat tie, and I didn't say that at all. I said, I'm excited about my apartment. Even in English, we misunderstand each other. What if you turn the meanings of the Bible into, into Greek philosophical? And it's terribly bad. You just misunderstand the whole thing. Okay. Greek was the language, this man said, they used to convey the universal Christian message. That's true, in the New Testament. But their mode of thinking was, to a large extent, Jewish. And Sean was making a profoundly difficult or easy point. that <laughs> The Bible's a Jewish book. Possible exception of Luke. Probable exception of Luke. For a full understanding, this man said, it's necessary for the modern Christian not only to study the Greek text, but to sense the Hebraic idea which the Jewish writers sought to convey in the Greek words. That's absolutely, fundamentally true. I cannot claim, this man said, to have become very skilled in this when he was a clergyman, but made enough progress to discover how greatly I, as a clergyman, had misinterpreted the Bible in the past. Like all ordained Christian ministers, I had spoken dogmatically, authoritatively from the pulpit, which no one may occupy without the license from the bishop. And much of what I had said had been misleading, because my own mind was incapable of giving a correct interpretation of the book. I was authorized to expound the book I was authorized to expound. For me, the realization of this fact made nonsense of the distinction between clergy and laity and was the main cause of my relinquishing, relinquishing my orders, gave up being a clergyman. It's a little encouraging, isn't it? There are people who are honest enough to see there's a problem. In describing, he goes on, my own intellectual deficiencies and the process by which I discovered my inability to grasp the meaning of the Bible across the vast linguistic gulf separating me from its Jewish writers, I can surely claim to write with first-hand knowledge. From what I know of the clergy in general, I see no reason for supposing that I was peculiar in suffering from this particular deficiency. In fact, the authority of the Protestant ministry is as a whole the, cl the claim to be able 
to understand the Bible and expound it as the Word of God is, in my view, a vast confidence trick. Wow. Contrick? Is this possible? That's awfully... Uh, maybe revealing. I am not accusing the clergy of being individually fraudulent or even insincere. The confidence trick is collective. Individually, those who engage in it are themselves deceived by it. But to remember that Paul said to be deceived is to be evil. Both deceiving and being deceived. So there's no value in being deceived at all, just the opposite. Just as when I began to expand the Bible from pulpits, I was fully confident at that point that I was able to give a correct interpretation. He goes on, some may believe that the right of ordination itself bestows divine grace sufficient to overcome any liability to mislead the congregation through an incorrect interpretation. If this view is held, however, it must be reconciled with the indisputable fact that the Christian ministry as a whole has produced a large number of different and often irreconcilable versions of the Christian faith, all of them supposed to have been derived from the same Bible. Any claim that training and ordination produce the only authentic Christian teaching is fraudulent, he says. For excellent information on church history and dogma, see Sean Finnegan's Intro to Church History. You must watch that. Wonderful. I've only seen two of them so far, but they're really excellent. Okay, the 39 articles, he says, finally, of the Church of England state specifically in no uncertain terms that true Christian doctrine is derived not from the Church's councils and traditions, but from sola scriptura. That's what is claimed. Anglo-Catholics believe the very opposite. They believe in the Church as well. Consequently, when one of them after induction to a benefice, that's taking a job as a clergy, when he reads the articles publicly and declares his assent to them, he virtually commits perjury. It is, however, legalized perjury. It's not a very pretty scene, is it? And I know I'm going at the negative side of it. We propose now, this is me, that the tendency to obscure the human being, Christ, the only Christ there is, arose in opposition to the central and essentially simple New Testament affirmation of Jesus as Messiah, the second Adam. I mean, is that difficult? Who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah, the son of the living God, and, and Jesus says, absolutely. What would be the Georgian? Right on, you know. You couldn't be writer. I can see the excitement of Jesus there. You are absolutely right. That's who I am. My church is based on Jesus as the Messiah. Do we need an army of theologians to interpret this? I don't think so. It's for all of us, isn't it? It's easy. The second, would you believe, the second hand, you see, if Jesus is God, this is me now, he's terribly overqualified for the job. If he's man, a model man, that's our brother. He's the best man on the team. Let's not throw him away and make him turn him into God or, heaven forbid, Michael the Archangel. It's wrong. It's simply wrong. So the pre-existence issue comes in there. If he's not man, Beginning to exist in the womb of his mother, Mary, this dear lady, 16 years old, and the Gabriel comes and gives her some inscrutable, incomprehensible theological lecture. Absolutely not. She understood what that was. You don't have a husband yet. You're not living with your husband. I'm going to do a miracle in your womb. That's so clear. It screams at you. No, don't talk about pre-existence. You can't exist before you exist. How can you be before you are? Can you be older than your own ancestor? I doubt it. So drop that on the basis of Luke 135. If you don't believe what, the Gabriel, what Gabriel said, they're in trouble. Because you remember what happened to Zechariah when he didn't believe what the angel said? Yeah. Nine months of dumbness, of being dumb. So people can raise all sorts of verses in John. Let them do it, but just let them realize that in doing that, they're contradicting Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Don't do that. I would say, even if you don't understand all the verses in John, I would accept Gabriel and Luke there, and Mary's acceptance of that. It's very easy, isn't it? Wonderfully simple. Okay. So the second Adam, he actually conceived, yet coming into existence in the womb of his mother. Matthew one twenty, that is, right? Translations are hiding it from you. It's actually begotten in her. Not conceived in her, and it is conceived, but it's actually begotten in her. Toyenithen in Greek there. Begotten in her. Fathered in her. Not just conceived. Yes, she conceived. But the word is actually begotten. Translations are hiding. Because they're trying not to let you see anything that might be unorthodox. That's Matthew 1.20. This view of Jesus' origin, we may, with Raymond Brown, famous Jesuit, Roman Catholic scholar, 
usefully call conception Christology or begetting Christology, fathering Christology. Brown insists, marvelous book, The Birth Narrative, good read for all of you, that Matthew and Luke know nothing at all of a literal pre-existence of the Messiah. Wow! He's only the top scholar in the whole Roman Catholic Church. He's dead now. And when he died, they said he was heretic. He was, because he agreed with us on this point. They could not, therefore, Raymond Brown implies, have been Trinitarian. They couldn't have been Trinitarian in the traditional sense. They could not, I suggest, therefore, join a Trinitarian church. Ooh. Jesus' conception for them is his coming into being. The germ of later Trinitarian theology should be sought elsewhere than in the, the Gospel accounts. Should he be ascribed then to John and Paul? or perhaps to a distortion of their writings caused by the speculative tendency of Greek philosophy. This influence was apparently already at work when John, writing at the end of the first century, pointedly emphasizes against an incipient Gnostic docetism, he only seems to be human, John emphasizes the human Jesus, you know the passages, right? He said, don't give up belief in the human Jesus, otherwise you're Antichrist, something like that. He came in the Greek ensarki as a human person within the sphere of human being. A human person, not into a human body. But guess what Luther did there? My German speaking friends here will appreciate this. Luther translates that not in flesh, but into the flesh. Dangerous. Luther read that as into the flesh. In das Fleisch, where my German friends here, right? rather than im Fleisch. They corrected that in all German translations. You see the elephant in the crime scene there? Into, no, I didn't say into the flesh. In the flesh, within the sphere of flesh. The German translations have corrected all that now. Okay, the subsequent development of Trinitarian thinking was encouraged by a misunderstanding of the Hebrew notion of word that just Dustin was talking about, by Justin Martyr, first of all. For John, Logos signified not a second person in the Godhead, but the self-expressive activity of God. Justin, who was a Platonist, however, had been accustomed to thinking of the Logos as an intermediary between God and man. Not unnaturally. Then, Justin reads back his philosophy because he was used to thinking of a second God, you see. He says, well, that must be Jesus. Now you lost it. Pre-existing. Pre-existing himself, being before he is. Older than his own ancestor? Mm. Awfully difficult, isn't it? Brain-breakingly difficult stuff, I think. Okay, he came in Sarki, that is, as a human person, not into a human body, which is a very different matter. John seems in his first epistle to be correcting an emerging misunderstanding of John's Logos doctrine. It was the impersonal, he goes on to say in his, in his epistle, it was the impersonal, non-personal, eternal life which was with the Father. First John 1, 2, that's great. So first John is commentary on his own gospel. He's saying, wait a minute, I didn't, I didn't say that in my gospel. Here's what I said, eternal life is with the Father. And now Joe and I are calling this the life of the age to come. We really need to get rid of this eternal life thing. It's very vague and, and, and philosophical. The life of the age to come. It's in Bishop Wright's translation now. Glad to say. This was with the Father before the birth of Jesus, not the Son himself pre-existing. In other words, John intended us to understand that when the Word became flesh, the transition was not that of a divine person, God the Son, becoming a human person, but of an impersonal personification like wisdom and so on. Like wisdom, Word of God, becoming an embo embodied as a human being. In John 1.5, oh, note this little detail, in John 1.5, the light is neuter, in Greek, tophos is neuter, because guess what? In verse 10, the light is masculine. Afton. You see what John's doing? The light was impersonal, not personal. But when you get to verse 10, Jesus has come into the world. Now he breaks the rules of grammar to tell you that the neuter light is really a person. Afton, not afto. Interesting little point. Okay, so these fathers always thought of Christ as subordinate to the one God. Right, I'm ending this paragraph by saying that though Justin Martyr and others began to believe in the so-called pre-existence, they were not Trinitarians. They believed that there was a time when the Son began to exist. Even Tertullian believed that. But you see, they'd shifted from what Mary would have understood 
One stage back, that's enough to, to change the name of the game. Now John Biddle. I want to give you just a bit on him because he's a favorite of mine. He was a schoolmaster. I'll help, help you to pronounce the English word here correctly because you might get it wrong and, and you wouldn't find your way to this place in England if you pronounce it wrong. John Biddle, there's his date, educated in classics and philosophy at Oxford, embarked on an, quote, impars impartial search of the scriptures after he began to question received church doctrine. From 1641 age 26, to 1645, Biddle was headmaster of the crypt school at Gloucester. No, Gloucester. 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 Not Gloucester. <laughs> Not Worcester. Worcester. Uh, British people are very inconsistent with their pronunciation. Magdalene is Maud Maudlin College. My uncle was at Maudlin College, Oxford. Not Magdalene, please. No, no, no. Maudlin, and so on. So this is Gloucester. You ask the way. Can I go to find Gloucester? Oh, one of, the, one, of these, one of these yanks, they'll say rudely to you, who doesn't know about pronouncing English words. Anyway, tiny point. It matters not. We'll not start a new denomination on that point, I promise. Okay. Okay. So anyway, he was, he, I love this because in the British system, you see, one of the staff members is put on, is assigned to doing RE. That's religious education. They, none of them want to do it. They don't know much about that. So somebody is told off, my dad used to say, told off to volunteer. Told off to volunteer <laughs> to do RE, religious education. Well, this bright man was told off to volunteer one term at the Gloucester School to teach religion. During this period that he, his close study of the New Testament caused him to become disaffected with the doctrine of the Trinity. The matter was of such serious nature. Now look what happened to this poor guy. That the magistrates issued an order for his arrest. Wow, I hope you're grateful this evening for the enormous freedoms we're enjoying here. But I don't see our policeman friend here, you know, ready to take us into custody. As far as I know, you haven't got a team out there ready to do it. Isn't, isn't it, you know, we should be daily thankful. You're not getting your throat slit for your beliefs. The matter was of such serious, the magistrates issued an order for his arrest. Imagine this, very dear to my, my own heart, because he's, he's a, a British schoolmaster. An imprisonment. Following a debate with Archbishop Usher, that's the famous Usher's chronology man, Biddle summed up the results of his study of early Christianity. He said this, The fathers of the first two centuries, or thereabouts, when the judgments of Christians were yet free, and not enslaved with the determinations of councils, they asserted that the Father was the only true God. Our monos alitinos theos, John 17, 3. I hope you all wake up every morning with that text pounding in your head. That's beautiful. I think it was actually Professor Tuggy, Adele Tuggy, who said in a, in a debate he was watching on a blog, and when I said John 17, 3 says that God is the only one who is true God, and he said, point buzzard. I scored a point. A nice compliment from a man, you know, learned in language. Okay, so that was interesting. Now, Biddle complained then, the Greek philosophical language of the creeds was, quote, first hatched by the subtlety of Satan in the heads of Platonists to pervert the worship of the true God. Parliament lost no time in ordering that Biddle's work be burned. In 1648, the British government passed what has been called the Draconian Ordinance for the punishment by death of, quote, blasphemies and heresies. I mean, Dale is right to remind us that we're living in kinder, should be living in much kinder times, and, and are to a large extent. That's what, what they pronounced against him. And so that draconian audience then punished him by death, or wanted to punish him by death for blasphemies and heresies, aimed at Biddle's claim that Trinitarian doctrine introduces three gods, and so subverts the unity of God, so frequently inculcated in Scripture. The Athanasian Creed is no answer to the problem, Biddle said. For who is there, if at least he dare make use of reason in his religion, who seeth not that this is as ridiculous as if one should say, Peter's an apostle, James an apostle, John an apostle, yet these are not three apostles but one apostle. <laughs> I mean, come on, we're awfully good in, in science these days, aren't we? Go to the moon and all that stuff. But is this the level of nonsense we're at in theology? I, I, I pose the question. 1655, poor guy. Biddle was committed to Newgate Prison in London for quote, publicly denying that Jesus Christ was the Almighty or the Most High God. 
supporters of Biddle were quick to point out that all Christians must be considered guilty of death by Parliament's latest attempt to suppress anti-Trinitarianism. For he that says that Christ died, Biddle pointed out, says that Christ was not God. Unless, of course, you sing the song by Charles Wesley, which says, it is mystery all, the mystery card of Sean, the immortal dies. Not sensible. Okay. So, what happened to this poor guy? Parliament's latest attempt to suppress anti-Trinitism, for he, I read that. A petition, next paragraph, for the release of Biddle, described him as a man, though differing from most of us in great matters of faith, yet by reason of his diligent study of scripture, sober, peaceable conversation, which some of us have, have intimate and good knowledge of, we cannot but judge very capable every way, sorry, capable of the liberty promised in the government. That's amazing, isn't it? So his friends stood by him to some extent. Though only 47 years old, Biddle had spent most, nearly 10 years of his life in prison for his insistence that God was a single person. He died in prison in 1662, a victim of odium theologicum and the filthy conditions of the place in which he was judged lodged. A sympathetic biographer wrote of Biddle's great zeal for promoting the Bible and so on. He valued not his doctrines for speculation, but for practice. Isn't that amazing? This, these are your brothers. These are the people, but for a few hundred years, this would have been you. My point is, this is a huge issue, isn't it? This is not something to be tossed away as a minor event in history. Okay. Then, a petition for the release of Biddle described him as, I, I think I might have read that, uh, yes, I did. Okay, 47 years. I got that. Next paragraph, but two. I want to remind you then, this is me, that the Council of Nicaea pronounced a formal anathema, the Council of Nicaea now, 325 AD, a formal anathema of excommunication and damnation on all, and thus all of you, who would not affirm the Trinity. That same cruel doctrine remains on the official books of evangelical and other churches. It is good to be aware of this if we tend in that environment. Does the pastor know about this? Does he care that non-Trinitarians are anathematized by the council that he claims to believe in? Does he know about it? A sympathetic biographer... Oh, it is, sorry. Okay, moving on. Does the pastor know that? Do we care that 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that Jesus was an angel and still is, though their founder, Russell, did not believe that, Rutherford did later, do we care about that? What they, what they believe. So there is a large potential ministry to XJWs. So if you've chosen your ministry to be Adonai and Yahweh, that's a lifetime. If you choose it, let's go after 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses. They need not become agnostic. They are. Ones coming out of Witnesses become agnostics or Trinitarians. Atheists. They give up. They belong here. And many of some are already now arriving in Abrahamic circles. I, the scene that I'm depicting is very tough, I admit that. My attempt is to be honest with the words of Scripture and avoid fatal compromise, which is all too easy to fall into. That's Mark 8, 38. He was ashamed of me in my words in this wicked, evil society, Yenea generation, this wicked, evil society after the second coming. I'll be terribly ashamed of him when I come back. Watch out. That's a fair warning. But then Jesus seems to have set the bar, not impossibly high, but very high. Matthew 7, 25, he warned of false prophets. That's to say, false religious teachers. And went on to say in that connection that multitudes will say on that future day, when we encounter Jesus face to face, multitudes will say, Lord, Kyrie, Kyrie, Lord, did we not teach and preach in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And didn't we do many dynamis, miracles, in your name? Come on, Jesus, look what we did. Look at the choirs we had. Look at the microphones. Look at this building. Wait a minute. Only to be rejected as not being Christian. I, I don't know what you make of I don't know what to make of all this. I, I'm just throwing these verses out because they are striking. The problem would seem to be the destructive lack of knowledge. In fact, isn't knowledge. Mentioned twice, Isaiah 5, 13, Hosea 4, 6. And then the text I've given you before, Isaiah 53, 11, they've been almost entirely ignored or twisted, particularly Isaiah 53, 11. Knowledge is, is 
a lot. Not just head knowledge, whatever that is. Not boring head knowledge, but information by which you act out. I see. That's the one. And it's repeated in Daniel 12, 3, top of page 7. Those who have insight now will shine brightly like the expanse of the heaven. And those who make many wise by their knowledge will shine like the stars forever and ever. That's Isaiah 53, 11, and Daniel 12, 3, twice over. Striking. Same point is made clearly in Proverbs 24, 24. And those texts there say, you mustn't curse good things, and you mustn't bless evil things. I hear people say, well, you only say things that are nice, like Thumper in Bambi. If you can't say anything nice, then don't say nothing at all. <laughs> That's not Jesus' method. The Laodicean church, did he say anything nice about them? No. Okay. So, the same point is made clearly in Proverbs. There it is. In the last days, you will clearly understand it. Jeremiah said the same thing. I'm against these prophets who have prophesied false dreams. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. And they're leading my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. I didn't send them. I didn't commission them. I didn't tell them to go. Nor do they furnish the people the slightest benefit. That might be, I add this now, why my colleagues in England go to church at the rate of 5%, probably 4%. The rest only go to be hatched, matched, and dispatched. That's a fact. Come to America, if it isn't a, a McDonald's, it's a church. This is a very religious nation. Not so in England. Okay, peace of mind from John 17. Finishing our first subject and complete change of pace. What we believe should give us rest and peace. I found this in a book on holistic medicine the other day. He said this, there is a specific feeling which has for millennia tantalized us with the promise of doing away with anxiety once and for all. And that's the feeling of certainty. Certainties are warm, dry shelters in the storm. Even certainties of the worst commonly relieve us, sorry, of the worst commonly relieve us of all the shapeless dreads of anxiety. There's a peace in not having to wonder and struggle after answers any more that seems to be able to surpass the fear of doom itself. Anxiety can cloud my thoughts and suspend me in helpless paralysis while a certainty lends me a basis for decision and action. I like that. Isn't that good? John 17, 3. You, Father, are the only one who is true God. Let's argue about it. Kent Ross is the only Kent Ross in this room that I know. Let's argue about, let's not. You see what we're doing here? This is simplicity itself. Perfect simplicity. I say this actually with, with uh, Steve here. Because you, when I got to know you first, you were immediately trotting out John 17, 3. 